I, I want to start out by saying that uh, we're going to try and just have an open discussion about a topic that I'm going to frame for us. Uh, we, hope that is, uh, we hope that you all have a lot of questions or you have comments to make, please do. Um, we won't go into a lot of detail on topics that have already been elaborated on quite extensively, including mass surveillance, the technical being used for mass surveillance, commercial mass surveillance, pins pie, all those great things. But, <clears throat> but we do want to have a discussion because we think it's an important one, and that's why we put today's panel together. Um, and I'd like to start out just by framing it for you, and then we'll introduce all of our panelists while we'll I have a little uh, bit to say, and then we'll just have a discussion. And I hope that's okay for you guys on day three of uh, a lot of <laughs> overload of meeting people and attending a million sessions back to back. <laughs> so this, uh, this panel came together as an idea based on um, what I'd like to create for you is a visual idea about what's happening around the world right now and has been happening for quite some time, but most of us were largely unaware of it until around 2011 when uh, documentation was found in the offices of the Egyptian Security Services uh, that linked the Egyptians to uh, Gamma International and the purchase of a mass surveillance technology called FinSpy. And that is a pendulum. Uh, within a state, I'd like to propose that the power balance essentially looks like a pendulum that swings. At various times in a well-functioning state, you'll find that the pendulum will swing one way or the other. At times, the advantage will be in the hands of civil society, and at other times, it will be in the advantage of the state. It may shift toward the state in cases uh, where you have war, insecurity, or disaster, but in a well-functioning state, you have civil society that is, that is competent enough and able to regain that power balance. In states where that power balance is uh, grossly imbalanced in authoritarian regimes or semi-authoritarian regimes around the world, you at least want a civil society that is working to uh, find a way to shift that power balance back in their favor, or you have people who are working in their favor to help that, help that happen. But I'd like to suggest that as a result of the proliferation of mass surveillance technologies, of those that are both commercially produced and free, as we've learned from our friends at EFF, that that power balance has dramatically and unacceptably shifted in the, to the advantage of governments around the world. Uh, this is not just the case in authoritarian regimes, uh, where they've purchased these technologies like in Bahrain. It's also the case in the United States. Mm -hmm. When we first had these discussions, the NSA revelations had not yet come to light. But the reality is that for many development actors around the world, working to empower civil society, uh, this power balance has shifted so dramatically in the favor of governments that, um, uh, and they were unaware of it, again, largely until the last three years. So that's a, that's a big framing for the discussion. And we'd like to talk about this issue not in terms of what it means for journalists and human rights activists, um, but what it means for development in general and how we can work to begin to fight the battle that we at least understand we're fighting now and begin to shift the power balance back in the favor of civil society. So the last thing I'll say before I uh, go to our panelists to introduce themselves is that uh, fundamentally these types of technologies uh, destroy trust and privacy within a society. Without trust and without privacy, civil society has absolutely no hope of being able to organize uh, a legitimate uh, protest against the government or to keep their government accountable. Absolutely no ability to do that. And today these technologies uh, obliterate the existence of trust and privacy um, in, within a society. So thank you very much for listening to that and I hope that helps frame our discussion. I will introduce myself. I'm Sarah Lange. I'm the executive director of the Arzu Foundation. We're a nonprofit and we work in Turkmenistan. We've learned these lessons the hard way. And we've been watching them evolve over the last three years. And uh, I'm very glad to be here with you all. Um, my name is Chris. I'm the director of data projects at Ushahidi. And my perspective is, is coming as a toolmaker. Right? We, we build tools that people use to crowdsource information for social good. It's used by activists and election monitors. So when I think about these things, I'm actually thinking about them in, in this um, sort of trickle-down way of, of, you know, we make tools for people to use, and then those people use those to gather information for another step down, and sort of trying to protect all the way down the state. That's where I'm, that's where I'm coming from. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very tired. I feel like I'm hungover, <laughs> although I had not a single drop of liquor last night. Does anybody feel like that? <laughs> um, that's the pop. 
That's me. That's best for me. Exactly. <laughs> see. I see. So I'm Josh Waynes. Uh, I work at USAID, the US Agency for International Development. Um, and my perspective is from one of a funder, a funder that funds a lot in the area of civil society, and, and increasingly in the areas of internet freedoms and internet governance. Um, so I'm really interested to hear about or how we can take this discussion and push it to some actions, to have some core questions about why the hell is it only that people like us in this room are worried about this and not everybody else, the larger capital civil society. Um, and also make a caveat to Sarah's very eloquent injury remarks that it's not just the tools, there's also the processes. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of public tools, and I'll get into this maybe in a bit, but thinking about um, uh, using what's already available to make sure that people are kept down. Sure. I'm Shauna Delu. I'm the founder and executive director of Community Red. We're an organization that looks at ways <clears throat> to use the existing tools or existing tools and, and processes to make people safe um, in the way that works best for them. I think so much of the time, I'll come at this from the point of view of capacity building because that's what that's what we're most interested in. We think a lot of the tools that already exist are good tools, good crypto, good back then. But we're coming at this um, from the perspective of sort of running around putting out fires, it seems, as a community. We'll throw a trainer into a difficult situation to give some people some ideas about some tools, and then like, hella, hella back, hella jet that person out of there. And then the people on the ground have no one to talk to um, when those one, two, five, ten tools don't really work for them. We do a lot of talking and a lot less listening. So we're looking at how we can sort of come at it from the other angle, um, not unlike what Yushiki is doing. Um, and give people much more awareness of risks, vulnerabilities, and threats in their day-to-day -day life. Chris, so I'm also, I mean, I can also talk a little bit about how, like, what this means for implementing on the ground, like how you actually do this, and how you begin to shift um, the, the technological, the communications advantage uh, to, the, to the hands of the people and away from the um, of government regimes, and, and one additional note, and that there are a couple of questions that I'll pose as we go along to the audience for discussion, mm -hmm. um, is that uh, nonviolent civil resistance uh, is, is really at the heart of what, what we are talking about um, today in places like Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And today, in 2004, if you all remember the Orange Revolution, the, mm -hmm. uh, the balance of power was firmly in the hands of the people. The government had yet to harness the power of the internet. Cell phones were a new communications tool, and they were hailed as really revolutionizing the process of protest. But today, in 2014, as we saw when text messages started popping up on protesters' cell phones in Independence Square, this is no longer the case. They're now being used uh, against the protesters, and the, the coin has completely shifted to the other side. So um, it's, it's about development, it's about uh, enabling people to protest openly and freely, and uh, if they do not have the ability to communicate privately, uh, they cannot do that. They cannot. Uh, if you remember the Opcor movement, uh, Opcor, a movement like Opcor didn't rely on cell phones uh, during their protest movement. Uh, they relied on hand-to-hand uh, -hand communication trade-offs and whatnot. Uh, but we're not in a world where we move backwards in our communications techniques. We move forwards. We've never seen an instance in history where we've moved backwards, and so we can't expect that other people will. Uh, be able to do that. So it's a matter of figuring out how to do it in the world in which we live in uh, safely and securely. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm not a moderator for Camfield. <laughs> You're not a moderator. You want to say something, Cam? Uh, it, it's not as safely and securely, but, but functional. Yeah. yeah, that's a big part of the balance. And I would argue it's not for protests. So much of my time um, in my work before was around Mexico. And so for, for that, it's like, how do we communicate without the narcos cutting our heads off? Like, how do we warn our neighbors and friends that there's, you know, a shootout at X and Y coordinate, like how, you know, this street and that street, like how can we do that without ending up hung up from an overpass over an interstate with some, you know, shit pinned to our body saying, don't ever do this again. This is what happens when you snitch. So it's all sorts of reasons that you would want to have private and secure communication. Yeah. I think one of the things that, that's really happened to us in the last few years is that uh, when Ushahidi got started, we dealt with security, but we really were, we were really, you know, thinking that the playing field was that, that we had an advantage, so it started in 2008, we had an advantage of technology and that people were using technologies and governments weren't that good at figuring out 
how to use that and that kind of stuff. Or especially governments like you, you know, you go work in like Zimbabwe and they're like, hey, it turns out it's like really hard for them to figure that stuff out. And you would use that to, to your advantage and you would think that. And we actually kept that assumption probably too long. That now it's like, oh wait, they just went and they signed a contract and now they have this incredible surveillance infrastructure that crushes our system and we never really saw that coming. And now we're playing catch up in the sense that we're all of a sudden, when we just instituted um, perfect forward secrecy and stuff like that that we like never really thought of a few years ago and now it's now we're like wait a minute it's a huge issue and I'll give you a very like specific example of a concern of mine that the question that I always get is that Ushihidi deals with crowdsourced technology right so people sending in a bunch of reports and we use those reports for various things um, or I guess our users use them and the people always ask me well, what about fake reports fake reports like that's it's a huge thing and over the years I've actually found no evidence of people sending in a really systematic campaign of fake reports, but I'm telling you it is only a matter of time before someone does that. Like, I, it is literally like months before someone's going to come in and be like, oh no, we have, you know, we've hired this group and they figured it out. It's totally only a matter of time. And it's actually something that we need to figure out a way to like spend that, actually figure out how to identify those and help our users identify those. But it's something that, you know, was totally not an issue a few years ago yeah. and now is clearly going to be the next thing that's going to hit me. But then you can consider yourself really important. <laughs> <laughs> the Twitter bots, right? We know in a number of countries the Twitter bots um, yeah, flood up. I just, I there's, there's this ambient thing that I want to push back on real quick, which yeah. is the idea that, um, that, that you said the coin is completely turned. People are uh, it still as incredibly capable with this technology as they have been, and the capabilities will only rise. And I would say right now, if we look around the world, the governments of the world do not feel that they have the total upper hand, given how many of them have toppled in the last few years. Like it, it's, it's a very scary situation for the governments. It's one of the reasons they are behaving as they are, is because actually the coin has not flipped. People are extremely empowered by this technology, frighteningly so. Um, and they're pushing back, but they're still pushing back on a rising tide. Yeah, no, I absolutely, I wouldn't disagree with you. I think, at least from what we've seen, is that the, is that, that empowerment, so you saw that that power balance was shifting, like the people were gaining an unprecedented ability to hold their governments accountable, to organize on a mass scale with unbelievable ease and, um, so we lost the other unbelievable ease part. Exactly. But we have the risk. <laughs> yeah. 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 So maybe we lost the advantage. <laughs> true. But then, and then the reaction was uh, during the Arab Spring, and you saw it happening. And it was interesting the timing of when this started to happen. We're talking 2010 and 2011. I think it's an interesting question to ask whether or not if the Arab Spring had happened 12 months later, if it had launched just 12 months later, would we have seen the same types of results that we saw? Not that they were even successes, that's a whole other discussion, um, uh, whether or not they were successful, but would we have seen the same type of mass organization had a people known that they were being surveyed in the way that they were, had they understood their government's capabilities, and had those governments really been able to, to use those capabilities to their full capacity? I think it's an interesting question. While there is definitely chilling effects, um, I think it's somewhat telling that they did send all those messages to the people in the Arab Maiden protests, who uh, clearly immediately left and went home. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fair point. <laughs> and, and also in Ukraine, they're very aware that they, the government has a uh, swarm from Russia. They have clearly now text message capabilities, and they're still using Facebook infinitely for all their communication. But that's because it works. Fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what people think it's going to work. That's that balance between like convenience. Well, at least in the, in the Arab world, we have more than the, the impact, impact of the Snowden revelations. <laughs> and our, our other, not, not as far as I can tell, um, and because the, the big part of what's important from the Snowden revelations is not the mass surveillance. That's not really like changing anything in terms of our, in, in terms of knowledge or in terms of how you approach training or in terms of how you approach education. That was an assumed thing anyway. Now we just have proof for the unbelieving, the unbelieving American funders who said, "No, this would never happen." And now we have like, well, actually, uh, but because you couldn't have the conversation with American funders, it was like, "No, this doesn't happen. You know, this is not a thing." But it's like, yeah, actually, it kind of is. Nah. The big thing is that the big revelation is that is the actually far-ranging uh, 
deep intrusion stuff that the NSA can do, uh, at least in the Palestinian context, we would safe to assume that the IDF's unit 8200 can do, and perhaps does. That's, that's an interesting thing. However, for most of the people that we work with, it's also irrelevant because nobody's going to spend that kind of money and resources on making sure they can read some journalist's computer using those MIG techniques, and they're not going to they're, gonna, they're just not going to do that when they can just go get the journalist, beat them up, and get the information yeah. in a much easier way. Or because they're dealing with NGOs who have bad security practices, just round up all their computers, <laughs> siphon up their data, which has now been very nicely ordered and organized by the NGO for them, and then say, have a nice day. In this honor, I want to disagree with you on one point there. That there, there are, there are um, countries, particularly in the former Soviet Union, that would actually go and rather invest the time and money to, to, to track what is being said and then quietly go and malign that journalist so that it's not perceived as so heavy handed uh, and also so that they can monitor and listen in because there's a value to listening in more than just going and arresting and beating the guy up because once you do that, he freezes up and no longer is going to be using that mechanism for journalism. But that's a country by country thing, but there are some places that do it. <laughs> <laughs> Also, Ray, to your point, um, I think it's, you know, with unfortunately a lot of these tactics, it's, it's multifaceted. Like I've seen both instances where there is the covert snooping, but also even if it's not necessarily going and, you know, using physical means of intimidation by beating someone up or whatever else, but even just subtly letting people know that they're constantly being watched yeah, or just yeah. coming up behind <clears throat> someone, telling them a little factoid, indicating to them that they've, uh, overheard a conversation, maybe asking some time to catch up over tea, things like that, to constantly just let them know that they're always being watched, whether it's on their computer or in their everyday lives as well. I just wondered from a funder's perspective or a donor's perspective, do you think there will be a trend based on what you're saying that when you apply for money, you should have a digital security plan. Just you should to, have a digital security. You should have it. Yeah. Organization yeah. should. But for instance, yeah. over the summer, I was with a colleague from Human Rights Watch, and I was super interested to hear about how they go about doing everything from the day you enter as an employee, through your life, through your tenure there. Very different from other NGOs that I know and work with. And it seems that they're kind of setting a good bar of best mm -hmm. practice. But also, when you like evaluate um, someone's pitch to you, do you consider their digital security plan and, and safety and how they're going? I mean, there's so much that goes into it that you seem to have. There's no shortage of good tips and practices and toolkits, and it seems that there's an approach that people, a methodology. Is that something that you that USAID or other donors expect to see in proposals now? So there's the difference between expect and be mandated to. Um, the, the instances of the last couple of years has made it really um, drawn attention to the fact that just like m &E should be included as part yes. and parcel of every proposal, monitoring and evaluation, mm -hmm. so should proportional digital security. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean though yet that it's enshrined in the code of what exactly you have to put in a proposal. Um, however, I, from my perspective, being the, the technologist, it, it shows that you are aware and you know what's happening. You, you, you're able to face the realities. Something that we would like is for, and I've spoken to a number of you in this room about this, getting together, kind of beating up on us to say, we as your partners would like you to force us or allow us to put a budget line item in the proposal so that we can do this and that we're required to do this and that we have independent audits, et cetera, et cetera, for making tools if we're doing whatever we're doing. Um, so that's something crucial that needs to happen as a partnership uh, in order to, for, to, to further. But Josh, what about that on the ground? I mean, for organizations you might be funding that may be wealthier or US based or Western based, like that may not be too difficult to fathom. Absolutely. But what if you're like in a village in some who knows where and like that just you don't even know what digital security is, but you're on the receiving end of like an implementer grant, like how how yeah, possible is that? Like how can you download yeah, how do you and then like deploy it? Backing <laughs> <laughs> up what weird. Alvin just said. <laughs> <laughs> how how can you expect folks to be using it on that level, or what do you see in terms of like capacity? Who, who so has the responsibility to the build issue. that? It, it's all of our responsibility to build that. From us requiring it from the, the, the large groups that maybe take, uh, or we work with directly, and then also in the re-granting aspect, it should be proportional. If you're working on, on tilling land in Antarctica, 
it, it, it doesn't have to have anything to yeah. do with, with machine <laughs> or with digital or security. But if you're if you're looking at keeping people safe, their data safe, health records, HIV status, etc., well, you have a you have a responsibility there. I mean, it has to be addressed. And so, from funder to implementer to person, a team on the ground, like everyone has that responsibility. That's proportional. How can we see that codified? Because yeah. there are lots of international development organizations who don't have a clue, yeah. funders that don't have a clue. Like, how do we see that being something that becomes institutionalized? That parallels, for, right, and for everyone, I think that question parallels the question mm -hmm. is why is it only the human rights civil society organizations are worried about this stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, how, how do we get this mainstream and integrated into everything else that we're doing? Um, why is it there so few countries have civil society organizations that are just focused on freedom of expression and have the ability and the chops to be able to look at internet governance and their freedom? Right? There's a huge, and there's a disconnect. I don't understand it. There's no mandate. Um, yeah, and banks have, have mandates. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. So right. how do we create that? Sure. Um, <laughs> well, this is, a, I just have some thoughts in response to that, and that was sort of like what you initially opened up with is why is it that it's only people here at these, um, you know, in these organizations and at these conferences who really care and are really interested. Um, and I wouldn't totally agree with, I mean, I would actually really disagree with that, but I think that the difference is that the people here have the education and the understanding. Um, but what I've, you know, I'm also not as deeply entrenched in, this, in these communities as I'm sure everyone else here is, but what I've noticed just being here is that the communication with, you know, the outside world is a huge struggle. Um, and I think a lot of the approaches um, are sort of, you know, we're talking about digital, we're talking about security, but we're talking about approaching them in ways that are still very traditional through the government, through these large organizations, instead of maybe looking at, you know, consumer behavior and how can we put products into the market. And I know that there are people, I know, Shauna, you're working on a product, you know, to do that right now. That's what my company does, is how can we um, reach people in a way that, you know, they're going to listen to and pay attention to. Because the make huge... What how do we make it necessary? How do we create that urgency? Right, that urgency and, you know, the way, I think the way um, a lot of ignorance is just perpetuated is through, you know, there's distractions, there's entertainment, people pay attention to things that they are entertained by. Um, people don't like to pay attention to things that scare the shit out of them. <laughs> Some do, yeah. but most don't, and that's what I see when you know when I enter in personal conversations talking to people about this. There's a wall that gets put up because to the common person, it's very overwhelming, yeah. it's terrifying, it's and it feels like the challenge is that you have to drop everything you're doing and dedicate your life and all of your attention to this. There's no easy solution um, no. to most people, no. and I think that's a huge no. challenge. There's no easy solution. <laughs> right. right, and I think and I think there are solutions. I think people here are developing those solutions, and what you're talking about as far as like taking action now, there are ways that we can do that, and there are non-traditional methods that we can do. This is a non-traditional new thing, and I don't think the traditional methods are really going to be appropriate. Um, so I um, actually, the last few things I've got into, like one of the things, I do do trainings, um, and I've tried to study what makes an effective training. Um, uh, and the first thing I do, um, and I think I want to put this out there as a generalized concept, is try and get away from the fear. Mm -hmm. Fear is actually specifically in psychology and physiology the worst state to learn in. So the fact that we start all these discussions with Everything is terrifying. Is one of the reasons, everything. Yeah, which is one of the reasons why I started by going, no, actually, everything is kind of wonderful, just the easiest thing. You know, it, it's just a tiny bit more work now. Um, when I start talking about cell phones, which, as everyone here knows, are the biggest security nightmare on earth, mm -hmm. I start off by saying your cell phone makes you a superhero. How many, uh, how many philosophers and kings would have given their lives for 10 minutes to your smartphone? I'm totally stealing that. <laughs> <laughs> have that. Have that. Um, um, so I think like this whole community has framed this around fear and terror mm -hmm. and other things that prevent the human brain from learning. Exactly. And it's yeah. so disempowering. I'm so tired of seeing a presentation that's like, holy shit, everybody's listening to everything you ever say always and recording it. <laughs> now. Good luck. Uh, uh, it's just like, what, what are we supposed to 
do with that? So I don't know why shut down. Along with uh, the, the cell phone superhero thing, I, I often say, like, this is a magical genie, <laughs> and the only way anyone has any power over you is by stealing the immense power you have. Hmm. Um, so we are living in a world of, like, amazing magical things, and the only way anyone can hurt us is by stealing all the magic we're given. I wanted to kind of rewind back to the funding and the community just a little bit. Um, last year we had a closed door session with kind of the classic ICT for D world in DC talking about security and privacy. Can you spell ICT for D world? Sorry, uh, technology and development. So Ushihidi is a classic example. It's frontline MCS, mobile medic connecting people and development challenges with technology. Really fun stuff and, and kind of my background. But And all the companies that work for it. <laughs> 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 um, there are many people in this space doing a lot of really great and empowering stuff with technology. But none of them have any security plan whatsoever. Yep. Like these are people working on yep. really sensitive election monitoring, working on uh, sex workers, and give me some violence. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll I give you a great, like, I was actually in a meeting when I used to work for Frontline, so I guess like a few years ago, and it was right when Syria was, start, it was like probably like, you know, six months into Syria really kicking off, um, and I was in a room with two State Department folks who were giving out money to other people to use the, the Frontline software, and they were talking with them, like, over the phone, I was in the room with the State Department person, they said, oh, so, you know, we should all use SMS because it's anonymous, oh my and I was God. like, Wait! <laughs> Wait! <laughs> but I was like, if I wasn't in the room, they would have had a long, like, they kept on running with that. But it's, it's not because they're, you know, it's not because they're stupid or anything like that. It's just, it's just because it was never, it's not thought about typically in the development context. Absolutely. Um, and it, it should be, right? But it's, it's just, it's not something that, you know, like, I mean, eight years ago, no one was ever like, oh, right, you know, we need to, like, have total secrecy and security around this, this Absolutely. kind of stuff. And now it's... So in terms of just the need for not only civil society um, actors, et cetera, on the ground, which I want to try to stop using because it's not fair, um, uh, w learning about how to be safe and secure, it's also everybody up the food chain, yes. um, from the top to the bottom. And so we're, we're working internally to try to engage on uh, how the internet works, but no one, when you make a call, what happens, what do you Like to just sexy marketing materials for us so that we don't have to always have these fights internally. Um, so if you could do that for us, then. Oh, yeah, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to um, actually engage Chris for a minute because I think there's been also an interesting aspect to this uh, in the development world, and that is a push right now for big data. We talked about the buzzword right now, but big data is, is it big data is extremely sexy. It's getting a lot of funding. There are projects like UN Global Pulse right now that are pushing for big development organizations, big disaster humanitarian relief organizations to not only gather data, but also share that data. Um, and this coincides with a time in which we are fighting an, um, an uphill stream battle to get secure communications into procedural documents within organizations to make sure that there is no weak link in the chain. So uh, Chris, maybe you could talk just a little bit about what yeah. it looks like for Shahidi. And maybe we can have a discussion a little bit about big data implications mm -hmm. within this realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, with Wichihidi, so people, we make free and open source software, so people download our software and use it. And our policies, they own their own data, right? It's, it's, it's that thing, we don't, we don't have any access to it or anything like that with, with our main product. Um, and I cannot tell you how many times this has happened. I mean, it's probably the vast majority of cases that people deploy the software to do something like monitor an election or uh, record, you know, uh, sexual violence like reports or anything like that, and they take these reports and they crowdsource them through Ushahidi, and then they go into a CSV document, and that CSV document is emailed about with everyone's name and phone number, and then they, you know, they, it's treated just as a regular document, and they just leave it on the computer and. I am terrified every single time this happens, but it is absolutely, the, you know, and what they're doing, which worries me so much, is they're actually gathering, they're doing like all this surveillance, and then they're leaving it on their own computer just waiting for someone to discover it, but it is a huge concern, and it, it I think 
what we have not done enough of is sort of to warn people like with features in the software to be like, hey, if you're going to take this out, realize that this is a huge issue. And so we had some um, data scientists come and they developed an algorithm to basically look through and be like, this is personal, like basically use machine learning to be like, all right, this looks like a phone number, this looks like someone's name, this looks like this stuff. Do you really want this in here? And that kind of thing. And I think that's something that we really you know, should do more of because it's an absolute concern that people take this data and they treat it for the long term, right? They have, like 10 years from now, they have all this incredibly, you know, either incriminating or embarrassing or something information and it gets lost or, you know, someone puts it on a laptop and the laptop gets, you know, stolen or sold or anything. Even if it's not a huge malicious government campaign, just being really sloppy with the data is very, very, very common. Um, I just wanted to link what you were saying back to Emily. Some donors have very funny ways of doing M&E mm -hmm. that would be very weird for what you're talking about because they keep databases of every person's name. I've seen pictures like of individuals, their addresses, their phone. I mean, all the stuff you wouldn't want to have fall into the wrong hands. And I think that if you could add, I don't know, it's interesting how, how, that, how much lack of security really exists. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> On the big data question, you know, I mean, the reason you deliver your software in open source so that people can use it and they store their own data is to give them a sense of agency over their data and, you know, it's not disappearing into the cloud and somebody else is responsible for it. But in, aren't you a better, um, aren't you in a better position than they are to, to manage their data on their behalf? No, <laughs> um, I would totally agree with that. No. Um, really? Because, uh, so the issue that comes up is there's, we build tools for other people to use and those, every single one of those uses comes with really strong local context, right? How much do they, how much do you need, do you need to anonymize stuff? What's the level of security? Because more security is more effort and more work and more resources and it's absolutely important in some contexts, but someone else is using it to sell Avon products in Russia or something like that. And we're like, all right, so maybe we don't need some like incredibly, you know, advanced system for this. Um, for us, our, our actual, our reason for, for not um, storing everyone's data on our, on our own system, <coughs> frankly, is that, um, we want people to be able to use the software however they want to use it. We want the lowest bar possible. And if we end up being like, okay, we're going to take your data, that means that we need to impose some kind of restrictions on how that data is shared and used. And that's really hard to do for the whole spectrum of users. Because um, what happens is, you know, I, I, what I don't want is for someone to have to fill out a license to download Ujahidi, right? That, the classic example is like, oh, why don't you have people required to do training before they download your software? And I really don't want that at all. Like, I really want people to be able to do it on their own without it. If I end up having to store the data, right, that means that I have to impose, okay, well, I'm not going to store your data unless it's anonymized. That means you have to take anonymized data or you have to, you know, aggregate or something like that. Um, that kind of stuff is, is a really heavy load to take on and it's not appropriate for most of the users and it can actually be uh, relatively dangerous depending on, um, you know, if we make a huge pot of all this wonderful beta data, we're kind of like asking someone to come and, and really Thank you. Cook. Join our, yeah, something like that. But you're basically <laughs> making the argument that you don't want that responsibility, mm -hmm. uh, because, and, you, and you want to push that responsibility out to the people who are actually using the software, but you're, you know, you're not answering the question about whether or not it's possible to imagine a situation where you have an engineering team that's actually capable of it, and they don't, um, capable of accepting that responsibility. I, I understand the context problem, that it's used in different ways with different people, but you could, also imagine a situation where the people could choose to have you kind of manage on their behalf and you know and, and actually you know impose a set of constraints that would you know based on your understanding of their context it would help them. Yeah yeah. So I, I will say we have a we're building a hosted version of it called G Black Tie which allows them to store their data with us. So there is like something like down down the pipe down the pipeline. Um, but it is, you know I think from our perspective, it is a huge responsibility to sit down and say, all right, well, I'm going to take all this data from all those things. And for us, it's, a, it's actually a large licensing problem because people assign their own license to their own data. And sometimes that, doesn't, that license doesn't include taking the data and giving it to us. But I mean, I think there could be definitely be context where it would be useful for, for them to be like to offload to us. Well, maybe it's not you, but maybe it's a, another service provider that uses your tools and they perhaps only serves a particular use case, which where they're at specific like a high case. security, mm -hmm. high security use case. Um, I mean, sure, I think I mean, could happen, yeah.
Okay, I think that's getting back to the larger point of responsibility. We have the knowledge, so shouldn't it be our responsibility? Well, guys, we guys know because one of the things that's mixed into this argument that I want to pull out that I think is really important is that we have an understanding of what secure looks like that fits for here, it fits for our lives in this place here and now. And that has, we may be in touch with local partners, but and have an understanding of what their life is like there, and the place that they're living, and what they're living with. They understand that, but they maybe don't understand the tech. So like, trying to do a tech transfer, but a cultural transfer at the same time is, it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it on a US-based trained Western engineer to figure out how to do that well. Um, not that they can't, but it just seems like much smarter in my mind to train the people on the ground, on the ground, about risks, vulnerabilities, and threats, and let them make their own calls. They're the ones that have PTSD and trauma from the years of having to deal with surveillance. They're the ones that know what the whisper campaigns are saying. A couple of weeks on the ground, a couple of months on the ground, we're not going to know any better how to threat model for them. Um, and so I think those are, those are two different pieces that both need to be addressed. And I get that responsibility piece. Like, I want to throw it on Josh, too. But unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I think it has to be, like he says, all along the chain with the local folks taking a bit of responsibility there, too. And I would really encourage uh, the implementing organizations and the funding organizations in the room to take what Chris said to heart and remember these words whenever they are talking to a vendor who tells them, yes, we'll take care of your data. <laughs> because you know that they are not telling the actual truth. Now, they might be actually being truthful in what they're saying. I'm not saying that they're, that they're being intentionally lying. But part of their business model means that they're going to be liable for somebody else's data. And at some point, their, business, their, their terms of service, if you go through them, will say, whoa, not our problem at some point. That's, the, that's, what, that's what you do when you talk with Gmail. That's what happens when you talk with Facebook. At some point, they just say, oh, that's our problem. You're not actually, like, this is not, uh, you've, lived, you've reached the limits where we actually care. It's nice to see you, goodbye, have a nice day. And, and this is even going to be more true when you have no legal remedy to say, oh, well, by the way, uh, well, no, you actually have a responsibility. And if you're a small NGO in Southeast Asia, then you're really SOL. And, you, and, and frequently, you, as the implementing organization, you, as the funding organization, have put them in that position by suggesting something like, why don't you host your data with this company? They are reliable, they are great engineers. And it's true, they are reliable, they have great engineers, but in the end, they don't. Their business model and their liability says they cannot be ultimately so responsible for your data. Listen to Chris. Next time somebody <laughs> wants to sell you on hosting data for your <laughs> endangered organizations. You've seen sort of a resurgence of the movement now. Um, Quick, of decentralization too, of like taking back your data and the ownership of your own data. Of like, you know, we hosted a techno activism third Monday. Check your cities. Out. Lots of cities, like something like 35 cities now have a TA3M that meets pretty regular, oh, th third Monday of the month. Um, we hosted one in February that was about taking your email back. So buying your own um, domain and then ho having email that is connected to the domain and no longer to Gmail still be used, you know, in Gmail, Yahoo, whatever, but it's your data, and you, no one's paying you for it. No one's get, they're taking it, they're getting all the benefit, and you get sort of screwed. So this movement around decentralization is something that we'll be exploring in the next month in Eurasia, but that generally I think you're seeing a resurgence of it. If, and if you talk, you know, it's, it's wonderful, because like, we're talking about, if you want to talk about real capacity building, mm -hmm. capacity building is not by hiring uh, consultant from <laughs> Germany or from the US to go to the country and tell them, you know, do this and do that. It's actually making sure that you can give them a three-year plan and hiring a sysadmin who can learn all, all these things that you fund to go learn and be a better sysadmin. And sure, maybe they'll leave and go someplace else, but make sure that you keep that opportunity open for those non-NGOs so that they can host their own email. So I love, I love the, the theory of that. It's beautiful. But would that work in Japan's name? Sorry to put you on the spot, <laughs> but the practicality of that, so it's, a, it's just, it's a continuum. Um, yes, in the perfect world, we'd be able to do that, everybody own their own stuff, everybody would have the capacity to, to, to be both the technical lead and, and, and everybody just knows this because it shouldn't have to be siphoned off as one specific thing. But that's, I, that's just in so many organizations that we work with, there's just not that capacity. But so what do, you, what do you do for that in that case? 
Right, but I think there's an important point to make. Sorry. <laughs> you might have something to say about this as well. Um, no, and, and the point is that it, it's about capacity building, but it's about long-term relationships. One of the problems that we see with funders is that they, they focus on buzzwords. They respond with funding um, that, that lasts for a year or maybe two years. This is not a two-year problem. This is a significant problem, and if you look at the number of people who are at this conference, these are the people who are really at the heart of this issue. There are maybe 200 of us. Think about the thousands and thousands of people, the millions and millions of dollars that are making this problem exist in the first place. We need commitment for a decade. We need organizations and we need cooperation between funders and organizations that say, no, we're in this for the long haul. We need to build capacity, even in Turkmenistan. We're bringing out people right now. We're creating opportunities for internships so that they're learning now, so that they're pursuing careers in this, so that maybe, no, not today, but in 10 years, we want that capacity to be there. So it's about those long-term relationships that we have to start building and focusing on. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And I think, but I also have the same concern that Josh is raising, which is, okay, well, when you're dealing with like a really scrappy human rights NGO that can, no one's actually really getting paid, but you know, and, and they probably aren't actually really connected to like real techie people in their lives at all. Like, it, it's just, there, there's a lot of barriers there. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're expecting them to have the responsibility for their data, then you have to educate them about mm -hmm. what that means mm -hmm. and, and about how to do that correctly because then it's almost like worse because they yeah. do have the situation that Chris is talking about where yeah. you, know, you have all this really important information that can just accidentally get in the wrong hands. And then people are really, really vulnerable. John? But I, I would still say, to taking their data away from them and having someone else take care of that is still the wrong path because it's still disempowering them. Even if they don't do every perfect security thing right, building that capacity there and not taking the problem away magically, the problem doesn't actually go away. It goes out of their power, mm -hmm. which is a different thing. I'm not actually kind of, I, I think, I mean, when you said relationships, you know, this is about relationships. I am sure there are people in Turkmenistan that can do this, mm -hmm. and that care about this, and have day jobs, and would still help. Mm -hmm. And I feel like one of the things that's completely disconnected in this community is that there are a whole bunch of people out there who aren't part of the funding, the funded NGO world. They never will be. Uh, they would hate this. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but you know, I've, <laughs> I've, I've worked with groups um, in my work, like Anonymous and Telecomics and so on and so forth, who are totally disinterested in the formal structures that are represented by the people here, have the capacity, value relationships above everything else. And I think the fact that this community doesn't tap that at all mm -hmm. is uh, stupid. Okay. <laughs> no, give us a twinkle. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, did you have, you had your hand up there? Oh, or maybe you did it that. So I have a, sitting under the potted plant, sort of a lot of, um, you know, interesting free ranging thoughts. Um, so the first one I would echo kind of going backwards. Um, I think the idea of fellowships is great. Um, I've just spent 20 years in the government and um, I'm starting Career 2.0. And it's at the intersection of technology and, and culture and how when 7 billion of us are connected online, what is it going to do to content creation and collaboration? Mm -hmm. So to that extent, I'm six degrees of separation or five from um, the, you know, this community, but it's, this is my learning opportunity. I love the idea of fellowships because the donors and the sponsors are in communities that are, that are pretty structured and very formal organizations. And as I look at fellowships to understand different communities, I realize they're targeted at sort of newcomers. So I think if there's an opportunity, as the planet connects, we can do remote fellowships. So that's one thought, is fellowships ought to go beyond, like I looked at a fellowship that you have to be seven years after your doctorate, or more than seven years after my doctorate. The point being that we, in the industrial world, we've got these structures, and information sharing is beyond the web, and it's beyond that, and it's, it's on the ground, right? The second point was um, to go from that six degrees of separation to first, one of the questions I kind of had for this panel, given that you're working in the developing communities, um, there is a hypothesis that's been sort of put forward that we as a planet might go to a self-policed or self-aware state. And, and not policed in the, in the hardcore nasty sense, but in the sense that think of Neighborhood Watch on your street when you grew up. 
Um, and the place that's going to happen is in the less uh, te technical infrastructure environments. So it's not going to happen here because we've got a lot of rules and regulations, uh, and the FBI and all these other communities that are policing us. But it's going to happen in places like Africa and other very new environments um, that Facebook will kind of bring online. So do you guys have a thought on, um, you know, as your communities become more so savvy, that they're going to watch out for their own rights? So anyway. Sure. So I think yes. We've always taken the approach. We work in one of the most difficult places in the world. Uh, we're always down here on the lists. Uh, but our, our role has never been to dictate. It's always been to be a, a bridge or a safety net. And then we, we work to support whatever goals are set by the communities themselves. So if they come to me and say, OK, I want to focus on LGBT issues, and I want to do a documentary film about that, well, we find a way how to figure out how to be um, able to do that, find the capacity for them to do that. And I think that the idea of, of focusing on the capacity building concept, like the fellowship concept, and not trying to force it into the traditional structures that we understand in the West as both development organizations and funders is really critical. Because ultimately, you need, and we've talked about this at some conferences earlier this year, it's about um, creating, develop, like empowering developers who are coming from these communities uh, themselves to have the capacity access to the training so that they're there is not, it's no longer an input, it's an output that's creating opportunities for these movements to progress um, and to take control again, whether it's over their own data and figure out how they want to do that and how they need to do that within their psychosocial context, within their cultural context, within the, the threat model that exists in their state. I, I, so I just completely agree with you. I think that's how we, we should go in this work. to change in these organizations where yeah. if you're a funder, for example, you're the SAID, um, if you're a funder, that agency ought to have um, some sort of awareness and say, you know, now that you're funding Interfinistan, we want you to go do a, a one-year fellowship after you've done two years of managing the project. And I know that sounds horrible to government and all these other things, but, uh, or like Fort Mushahidi, I mean, pick, pick any structure. It just seems like that's, um, we're relying, I think, a lot on um, this for our information sharing. And, and I think the points um, you made, the, um, the whole cultural context of us being human and building relationships and being connected as six, seven billion people is lost. That's not what this is designed for. So anyway, that's kind of my emotive point. Yeah. I think it's important for us to keep in mind that technology is only a tool. Technology, mm -hmm. it only amplifies or it agitates. Um, it's never a solution. <laughs> um, yes. It's never a solution. And it's that offline, it's the face-to-face. -face. Sure, bite-to-bite -bite is important, but it's the face-to-face -face that really matters. And we're definitely, we're trying to embrace that. We're trying to do uh, new types of thinking about new frameworks for development, looking at creating e ecosystems of, I'm not gonna use the I word, but ecosystem of new things happening. Um, <laughs> you know you want to come on. Okay. Um, but, try, but trying to embrace that, uh, to the greatest extent that we can. Um, I, you, you made a point about uh, community uh, policing via Facebook or whatnot. I don't have any specific thoughts on that, but I really wonder about the opportunity cost of uh, moving from online to offline. Mm -hmm. I was recently in a country um, where in the public sphere, you cannot say anything uh, freely or openly. If you go to Facebook, it's a completely different world. Yeah. Um, there's a, Lots, lots, and lots, and lots. Even this is, you know, a place that has very low literacy. Very, but still, those who can get online, ooh, watch out. Um, they, if you're connected at work, you're probably online on Facebook talking about the upcoming elections and not actually doing work. There's some some interesting studies about that. But looking at, at that, where is that tip off? Where's where's that trading point? What has to happen else in that system so that there is that opportunity cost is lower? Um, we know that the internet and technology decreases the time it takes to reach that tipping point. But what are the other factors that really help in, in galvanizing um, people to be able to come um, out of their screens and not be worried about, in some countries they say, sure, there's free access to the internet, but there's no free access after the internet. So you walk out your door after you post a blog post and you're in jail. Um, yeah. So there's this, just some, some of the thoughts based on your comments. So yeah. This is like all mushrooms are edible at least once. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 I got your reference from in the party chat. Point, you know, I spent a lot of years working for the government too, 
and uh, following Mexico <laughs> and Central, huh? Did you show them? And uh, Central America, and I was, you know, we they were really interested in one in, in looking at. This was the, around the 2012 elections in Mexico. We were seeing a lot of movements there, people coming out of their homes. And, and this is not a safe environment either. I mean, little do we know up here <laughs> that in our backyard, like people are dying all the time um, for saying things that are anti-government or for saying things that are anti-narco or for saying things that are whatever. It falls sort of under the whole like, oh, narco's got them. When who knows who gets them, you know, or why they go. Um, but so to see these movements, that there was the Yo Soy Ciento Treinta Dos, there were other movements that were like no más sangre, they were around like no more violence, but also like problems with the elections. And you saw these people galvanize in a way that was really inspiring to me to leave my job and actually do something to help them. <laughs> but I think you see that and you see the beginnings of policing. This is something I wanted to mention too when Chris, when you were talking about like the potential for there being fake profiles or fake information, fake um, reports. What we saw always following stuff in the open source in Mexico and Central America was a bit of the policing happening that's pretty normal, I think, in Central America anyway. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of vigilantism that happens. People police their own towns. And in Southern Mexico, where things are poor, they have more than usos y costumbres. Like, uh, they just have like self-governance um, in a lot of places. So we would see more of that happening there, where there is internet. Like, you would see more self-policing, where self-policing was already kind of a physical IRL norm. But one of the things I wanted to mention was how watching, you know, like watching the fake reports come up, watching people say, no, this is a narco. This guy clearly isn't real. You guys don't listen to what user whatever says because he's clearly a narco, or he's clearly, uh, clearly like a military plan, or he's clearly, people had their own ways of defining what was real and fake, and in ways that, you know, as an analyst at a desk, I could never imagine. And there again, like, we go back to sort of the local, knowledge and the relationships and the understanding of, of truth on the ground, to keep using the phrases. Innovative truth. Innovative on the ground truth. Innovative. Innovative. This is, this is kind of captured in the concept of mitis, the, the concept of the kind of the coming in the local and the, and the not quantifiable uh, knowledge. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things that we see about the internet is that it enables mitis more than it does quantitative analysis, despite the culture of techies not really understanding that that's a thing. So. Yeah, so I mean, just as an example, we deployed, very early on in Ushahidi, we deployed in the, so Ushahidi's a Kenyan organization, most people work in Kenyan. Um, and this is weird, but. Um, <laughs> that's a signal that it's not. Uh, um. Um, and so when we deployed, the first time Ushahidi was deployed was in Kenya, and, and I wasn't there at the time, but they did a very good job of like sifting through fake reports. They kind of knew what, what looked fake and what not, right? They had to eyeball with it. And then we deployed to the DRC like a year later. Turns out we have no idea, right? Like even a bunch of Kenyans have no idea what like what is a local, you know, what, what is what looks fake. And so the only time that we actually deploy is when there's a Kenyan election. So um, last year we did the, the Uchiguzi, which was our deployment for the Kenyan election. But like the only reason we can do that is local knowledge. Like that's and that's it. And if you move like one country over, or even if you like go like a little bit beyond, it's like oh wait, like that that kind of like ability to distinguish stuff is you know there's no there's no algorithm I can make that can be like oh these ones are clearly fake. I can do things to suggest things. I can take the obvious ones out, but there is there's this definitely like thing where it's so much easier for someone to eyeball it and be like whoa 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 that's like weird. But local knowledge isn't local knowledge per se anymore. Local can be local to an area of interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. So you can have people, and I think this is a really, really important thing that gets lost in a lot of these debates, especially when we talk about trying to connect people across lines. So there's people in Turkmenistan that, um, well, like, I have this running joke that I can go almost anywhere in the world and find a couch to sleep on because I, sleep, I speak lolcat. There's some truth to this in that, that like, um, there's people in any of those locations that they have, you know, they know Bob put in that report, it sounds like Bob and he's an asshole, right? But, um, but then there's like the people all around the world who recognize signs of certain things on the network or in certain subcultures and that sort of thing. So um, uh, we, I don't want us to emphasize the local in terms of locale while robbing the local in terms of, of uh, subcultural knowledge. Yeah, mm -hmm. mine was more in the context of the election. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, I just, Some of the local. I think, so one of my favorite, just a 
small anecdote, one of my favorite um, attempts by the Turkmen government to um, find out organizational info is that they, um, they create Facebook profiles of students who are in Turkmenistan, and they all have their photos taken for their Facebook profiles with a picture of the president in the background, and they're all wearing a black suit with a skinny black tie, and they have, like, they have two friends on their Facebook profile, and they're all very serious this and then clearly they're working for the security services but they send me the same five questions the same five questions every time in the Facebook post and they ask who funds you what are you doing where do you live who do you work with uh, and then they, every, you know it's like every two or three weeks that they have these new pictures that come up and uh, this last year like guys guys for all the money you're dumping into Fish Fisher you may want to put some dots the this was an interesting point to say is that in some like external knowledge can do things local knowledge can't and having those bridges, I'm not saying that locals would have but, <laughs> but in general, like there's things that might get by kind of local mythologies that locals yeah. can use to be deceptive that would scan as total bullshit to an outsider. So having those relationships. Yeah. But in that case, why are those guys so dumb? That's inexplicable to me. I, I really wish I could tell you that. Maybe <laughs> locally that would work. Well, also nepotism <laughs> uh, doesn't turn out to be the best way of staffing. So in Turkmenistan, in Azerbaijan, we have the same same stuff. Like the Secret Service people, the Ministry of Maternal Affairs people, they create fake profiles on Facebook. It's always a serious picture in a suit, and you know they're always the same things. It, 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 Masters of disguise. <laughs> <laughs> the reason these countries don't work is because they're giving their stupid time to these jobs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you have a lot of same personality on the desk, and you're like, that is a government issued like replica of the capital of Ashgabat that has like Barry Mukhamia's face like in like the resin. Do you ever send them like, yeah, we're having a secret meeting tonight? Do not troll the government. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I always, res I always respond, and I always respond very nicely, and I always ask them if we could have a phone chat to talk, and then they go away, because we both disappear. So, yeah. I've yet to get one to respond, but I'm really hoping at one point they will. But, I mean, you can, I mean, it just goes to the stupidity of, sort of, of government, but if you look at, like, who we suspect is buying tools from hacking team, like, that's the kind of a who's who of, of idiotic government. Like, if you're, if you're, if you're, a, hacking, if you're a hacking team client, that pretty much puts you on the on the not on the list of people you don't want to hang out with for a smart conversation on the governmental level because these are not they're, they're hacking team clients. If they had actual good systems for uh, investigating what's happening in their countries, they wouldn't be using hacking. Didn't hacking team recently say the US was its top client? I think I think I think my statement stands. No, I I I You know who you, who, who you know is not a happy team client is Israel. For example. Yeah. Yeah. And when they are and, and when they and, and that too. But when they're making when they're making uh, you know you don't like if they're asking you questions, then you know it's a, then you know it's not actually a serious thing because they have really good teams for doing uh, Palestinian infiltration and they have really good training for that. So uh, that's like on the other end of a, of a different kind of spectrum of what you're working with. It's like they're not they're not the guys with the really cheap suits and the skinny ties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean the thing about America and the reason why this is relevant, very true, just as an aside, is that. Um, America's weird structure is such that all the different levels end up buying independently right. mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. So Podunk Police Department, somewhere that doesn't even know it's a, it's a wiretap uh, law violation, may buy this sort of shit mm -hmm. <laughs> and just try to hide it from, <laughs> from the judge. <laughs> Lauren, did you even die to say something? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm like a yeah. patient schoolgirl back here. Like, raising my <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, what you were saying about the way you handle these um, Facebook inquiries, you know, <laughs> friend request. Friend request. <laughs> it's something that's so simple, but I, back to Josh's comment, like how, how can we take action? How can we actually get results out of everything that's going on? All of you guys have some unique areas of expertise, and I'm just kind of wondering, like, what's one major thing that, that you're doing right now that is working, that mm. you can kind of share so you can get those ideas? Flowing because I'm yeah. that's what I want to hear from you. Yeah. So, one thing that we're doing that has, has been super successful, although 
harder than anything maybe I've done um, in my career um, is um, being able to do longer, long-term mentoring with individual organizations on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, I work with uh, Ray Short here, I'm going to call you out, is the chief of a party of a, of a project that ISC funds, uh, that USAID funds called uh, the Information Safety Capacity Project. Um, and it's about long-term engagement with specific organizations and not about parachuting in. And then that has, it's great for the organizations to be able to become, have, have the, the requisite acumen of the GSEC and information uh, knowledge in general, comma, but the, the learning that that's done in, internally has been uh, helped move mountains in terms of talking about cyber stuff because it's scary. In, because we're, the, we're, we're USAID, we're the development arm, so we don't want to talk about these issues. Um, so that's something that, that, we, that we're doing specifically. Yeah. I would say while we're waiting for funding to come through on our larger projects that I think would be really helpful in a humanitarian, like in a larger context, one of the things that we're doing right now that I think is, has been incredibly useful is really expanding the community of people who are into this. I mean, when I came onto the scene not that long ago, there were, there were great folks that were working in D.C. around this and with me, and they were very nice and they taught me a whole bunch of stuff, and very quickly I realized that we were a pretty secular, pretty like small, pretty like narrow, not, we just didn't, I don't think we realized the potential we had to connect with a lot of other people. So it's been obviously community red, is the I mean, it's no joke, community is a big deal to us. So we've built a lot of partnerships, not just in DC and in New York and the United States, but sort of globally, and really worked to bring people into the fray that otherwise wouldn't, they were interested, they just didn't know they were. You know, they didn't know that this existed. It's kind of Byzantine and the people who, I don't want to talk badly about folks that were the initial, like the OGs, but maybe not the most personal people sometimes, you know? So we've done a lot, I think, to original Original gangster. gangster. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to Lynn to know. But I feel like we have done a lot to, and with the support of IDC and, and through them, y'all, full disclosure, but um, really broadening um, the scope to use it a hacking phrase, really brought a lot of people in that otherwise were not aware of what was going on and their need for it. Mine is really, oh, sorry. Oh. No, no. I'm sorry, I thought <laughs> I mean, we were right going to say one thing. I was going. I mean, do you want to have a question if you guys want no, to talk no, about me? Right, well, well, I just wanted to, since I was called out, uh, I, wanted to answer, I wanted to add something to you before we go to Chris to answer your question. Um, it takes money. Because uh, to, to do this mentoring, to do this, this repeat visiting, because uh, adherence to use of tools is very low, uh, to get to the people in Turkmenistan, for example, um, we're going there tomorrow, right, Joshua? Yep. Exactly. Uh, um, requires going on the ground to travel to these places because these people you know, won't, won't trust you if they chat with you online, they don't know you from squat. Um, and that simply just takes money. So, and that's a problem, that's a challenge, that's, that's a hurdle to doing what and you're talking about. And that challenge, is there like any just small element that's really working that you're seeing that's mm -hmm. sort of standing out as something that, you know, maybe a lot of things there's challenges, but when there's one like... Well, you get somebody, you get somebody who natively speaks their language. You know, not, not as a second or third or fourth language. Somebody who um, perhaps is um, familiar with the context. Somebody who... Um, is not coming from a spy or military background, but, and, and somebody, and I'm talking mostly about our staff, who understands civil society, understands human rights um, um, activists. And those are, those are diamonds in the rough, but they do exist. And many of them are sitting in this room, um, but you need, you need to have the social and local context, and that's, you know, that, that also takes money. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, so I'm hearing so far, and you guys are kind of, there's a lot of community building and connections, is what yeah. it sounds like it's going down mm -hmm. to. <laughs> now that we just had a discussion of the community, I guess my only thing was like, our, our new phrase is like, encrypt all the things, <laughs> is basically what we're going for. Um, it's really pushing on, you know, like, just getting SSL all the way, like, all of those things with all the different products that we have, trying to encrypt all the, you know, all the databases, just moving through. It takes really, you know, it turns out it's much more difficult. I'm not the developer in the, um, in the group, so, you know. Watching them just like march through all the different parts of it and be like, oh wait, there's this other database over here. <coughs> Let's go and then make sure you know um, perfect forward secrecy and stuff like that. Just slowly going through. Um, that's that's what we're pushing. So one thing that we've been so the, so basically the last two years we've been figuring out how to do this right, and we've made some mistakes and we've been learning along the way and asking a lot of really great people, many of them in this room, to, I think finally figuring out the right questions to ask. But this the last three months for the first time. 
we are having young Turkmen get in touch with us to ask us questions about their own personal security. Hell they're yeah. asking how to use tools, they're asking how to send email safely, they're asking how to communicate with people back home. Those questions were not being asked. And so providing an entree into this world by giving them a little bit of information, not not the terrifying tactics, although some of it was honestly a little bit scary. And I like, actually, we may reframe some of our discussions based on the problem. Um, <laughs> keep your genie in the bubble. Um, <laughs> But now that we actually have young people asking, we know that the demand is going to grow. Yeah. And the way that these networks work, especially in closed societies, many of you already know, is that you only need one person to know. And then they're going to go home, and they're going to talk to their mom, they're going to talk to their cousin, they're going to go to the wedding, they're going to go to blah, blah, blah. And then it, it, it grows and it expands, and that's how you start to build a momentum for demand that you can then begin to meet as an organization. So I would say talking about the issue, and then beginning to spread out that information, and then being a trusted source of information when they're having questions or they're facing challenges is really critical, but that also takes time and it takes, uh, it takes commitment to a place and to those relationships over, over the period of time you need to establish that trust. Yeah, um, no, I just kind of wanted to echo what you say. I feel like, especially in work around closed societies, which I feel like is work that you can get very easily jaded in because it's so difficult. You try so many different ways to get in and disseminate information. Nine times out of ten, you're just like totally shot down. Yeah. Um, but I definitely think that people um, underestimate the power of, you know, as long as you get like one really good person. And, you know, I think, too, it's, you know, people people miss people underestimate that, and then also, you know, it's it's striking how when you provide even like the simplest channel for people to actually like feel empowered to stand up and sort of take control and say, okay, well, you know, I'm actually gonna really do something with this information that you've given me, and I really feel comfortable, and yeah. you know, you've been given like a really safe space. Like the example of that is in um, in one country that we work in in interviews, we were doing a, um, a virtual training. Through, um, through go to meeting, and halfway through the training, uh, one of the trainees stood up and was really passionate about um, about using TrueCrypt, and he basically said, "Okay, well, you know, I think that something I'd really like to do is I'd like to further train on this." And he ended up doing a series of trainings on TrueCrypt for people that were not only in the room but beyond the space of the training, and he trained like twelve or fifteen people on this tool in the space of a week. Um, so I definitely, you know, there are definitely a lot of success stories Absolutely. that have come out of this. Um, and I think even, you know, just making sure that we, like, take the time, like, this is something Octavia was saying the other day, I think, like, making sure that we actually take down these success stories mm -hmm. and use them, when, like, when we're trying to frame these approaches for the communities that we're working with yeah. and kind of giving them, you know, this glimmer of hope that, yeah, you know, yeah. this is definitely something that can be done. She said, one thing you don't do, one thing you you do do different, one thing you don't do any longer, one thing you do differently, and one thing you keep doing that you've been doing right. Yeah, exactly. Like approaching it in sort of these bite-sized pieces, I mean, you're not all wrong. Yeah. I, in, in terms of closed societies, I think about China. I mean, I was there in 2007, 2008, 2009 on a fellowship, a national security fellowship, where my life I thought was going. I was using circumvention tools before I even knew what they were, because I just wanted to get on Facebook and chat with my friends back home and watch TV for free, you know what I mean? Like, I, I take such hope in the Chinese netizens because they're super sophisticated. Net nanny bears down on them, they find another way around. Over and over and over again. And there's such a shining example of like, if you gotta, it's not too painful to figure out how to get around it. I mean, sure, it is, it is. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say that People don't, there's not a lot of BSD, blood, sweat, and tears, or just a lot of blood that goes into that. But, you know, there's something to having homegrown development expertise. And there's something to having a lot of will and urgency. Um, people get really creative. Yes. Um, so something else that I would say is, is helpful, too, is, um, and especially um, as part of working with local organizations to have that sustained relationship to start uh, raising awareness and encouraging practice and, and regular use of, of uh, these tools and these practices is also, um, especially in thinking about how to initially reach these groups, is um, thinking about how to bring these things as part of their everyday workflow and everyday lives, like something uh, like I've been working for NGOs that have done uh, this type of assistance for a while and something you know, that I've seen that's really promising is moving away from this parachute model and actually working from the onset of beginning projects. And something I've been very pleased by is actually 
understand, working with groups to understand the types of activities that they need to do, what they mm -hmm. would like to accomplish in a few years, in a year, or whatever else based on their projects, and finding the right tools and approaches that can fit into that work plan. So it's not something that, oh god, I need to monitor an election, I know I'm supposed to use these secure tools, but blah, and then uh, you know, go back to, to old habits, but actually be, have the time to actually practice to understand <coughs> and have granted time to ask the right questions and get assistance either from, either from other organizations or, for, or from local talent as well uh, to think through that as well. So. So I think actually it's done. It's 11.45. I think that's technically when our session ends. So I think all of us are happy to stay in chat, but I think there are other sessions to go to. So just thank you guys so much for a really good conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. There's no other best panel I've ever been to. Like, yeah. not that I spoke on, but I like it. <laughs> in terms of audience engagement, we jumped on our free call. We were like, what? We'll just, we'll just throw out a couple of hard questions and sit back and let's get it. Yeah. So thank you guys so much. Privacy. Privacy. Here we go. Go. Excellent.